Hi, and welcome back to the Judaism From Within podcast. My name is Similana. I want to introduce you to an interesting idea. The idea that every worldview comes with a certain bitter pill. What I mean by that is that every worldview a person chooses, there'll be aspects of it that they like and aspects of it that they don't like. Aspects of it that fit into the society in which they exist, and aspects that just simply clash with it. And being a child of the society in which you are born, that's just inevitable. There are certain ideas within Judaism that we find easier to process, easier to assimilate. That's what I want to discuss this week. But at the same time, maybe look at other societies and other Jewish thinkers and how they presented ideas, and perhaps come away with a deeper appreciation of Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch and the people he was following, or his ideological fathers. It's interesting because it really does relate to the title of the podcast, Judaism from Within, which was Rav Hirsch's slogan, Judaism understood from within itself. This was in opposition to describing Judaism from the perspective or embedded in another culture or another worldview. The reason why this is so valuable from our point of view is is as the culture changes, his ideas and his messages, I believe, are still impactful and relevant. The topic I want to focus on is sacrifices. And the reason why I think this is a good example to illustrate this point of relevance is because when it comes to sacrifices, we often have maybe a bit of a visceral reaction to the idea of killing animals and somehow that being religiously enlightening. But at the same time, it does take a very prominent stage in the Jewish tradition. Now, how Rav Hirsch extracts the principle that's been given over by a particular sacrifice really brings to light his worldview and how he had the ability to extract timeless messages of Jewish thought and Jewish philosophy from actions with the use of a symbolic appreciation. The idea I'm referring to is embedded in this week's parasha. To give us a insight into the narrative, Joseph has been away. His father has just been told that Joseph is in fact alive, at which point his father, Jacob, travels towards to seeing his son, and on his way he brings a sacrifice. Your emotional relationship to the idea of a sacrifice will obviously change depending on where you were born and the society in which you live. But Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch's approach to explaining the different types of sacrifices and how they brought out different principles and different ideas has a certain timelessness to it. What I mean by a timelessness is that he didn't develop these ideas in contrast to the society that he was brought up in. He developed them, at least from his point of view, from within Judaism itself. Meaning, he looked at principles that Judaism held to be valuable, saw their interconnections between the different sacrifices, and used that as a platform to give the reasons for them. Of course, he described these ideas because of a certain stimulus. There was something that brought it on. The questions, the approach, the philosophical tendencies of his society moved him to ask these questions or explain these ideas. I'm talking about his method. An ideological father of Rav Hirsch would be someone like Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in his Kuzari. Once again, he was writing in a certain historical context. He had different worldviews open in front of him, and thereby developed Judaism on its own terms. Yes, one was in the 12th century and one was in the 19th century, but there was a certain similarity to those two historical contexts. If you move it to someone like Maimonides, who was writing in a more dogmatic environment, and what I mean by dogmatic is that Aristotle was, for all intents and purposes, half the truth you were working with on the table. You had to contend with Aristotle. There was no way around it. Maimonides wasn't writing his guide to the perplex in opposition to Aristotle. He was contending with Aristotle as being a fundamental description of reality. Of course, at times, he disagreed with Aristotle, but he developed his philosophy based off that speculative philosophy. Today, we don't find Aristotle's system of metaphysics that attractive. That doesn't mean there are not values and principles and ways of looking at the world that are essential or valuable embedded within the Marne Vuchim, the guide to the perplex. An example of this would be if we paralleled his explanation for the need of sacrifices. 
From the point of view of Maimonides, it was a certain weaning off of idolatry, that sacrifices were needed in a system for the Jewish people to move them away from the paganistic rites of their ancestors. A truth, a principle that he's articulating there is hugely valuable, granted, but now how I appreciate the individual sacrifices and their relevance becomes completely immaterial. But there is a difference in developing a philosophy in the context of another philosophy, as in the case of Maimonides, where the intellect took centre stage in every respect, not to the exclusion of other human attributes, but definitely centre stage, or attempting, as best you can, to develop Judaism from within itself. I say as best you can, because of course you can't extract yourself from your environment. You still use the tools that are open to you in giving voice to your ideas. But the question is, what is your method of development? That's why I want to use as a platform for this idea both Rav Yehuda Halevi as well as Rav Hirsch to articulate this idea that I say Judaism has embedded in it that really is empowering in this day and age that I refer to at the beginning of this lecture. So back to this idea of a sacrifice Yaakov brought up. Yaakov brought up a zevach, which in other words is often referred to as a shlomim, a peace offering. An offering or a sacrifice that embodies a certain emotional relationship a Jew has towards his God and his religion. What Rav Hirsch does when it comes to different sacrifices is similar to what we do when it comes to God's names. Different names of gods that appear in the Bible, we don't look at it God having a different personality, but we look at it as exhibiting a certain principle, a certain mode of interaction with the world, be it an educational reaction, be it a aspect of justice, the different names of gods that appear throughout the Bible illustrate different ideas. In a similar sort of way for Rav Hirsch, the idea of sacrifices, and the one that a Shlomim articulates, is a feeling of being at peace. But not simply things being okay, but you being at a stage where you have everything you want, you have everything you need, Jacob had his son back, it was right. This wasn't thank you. A thank you represents that classical relationship people have towards religion. And I'm trying to tease out this uniquely Jewish principle. Thank you is, God, you are so powerful. Thank you for giving me. An oiler, an uplifting offering is, I want to be closer to you. All these relationships with God are almost universal. People experience this relationship with God across cultures. Rav Hirsch is telling us that this idea of a shlamim is uniquely Jewish. You partake of the Korban, you enjoy it. A Jew, in terms of his relationship with God, isn't one based off need, one based off I am so low, I need you, or the Freudian accusation of the God as the Father that you need in your lowly times, or the Marxist accusation of the opiate of the masses. All these other relationships that we do have with God are open to that accusation. Being open to an accusation doesn't make it true, but it definitely opens the door to that sort of accusation. Yaakov was at peace. His family was now complete, and he was giving expression to this. But think about how unspiritual that is. When people are looking for spirituality, they flee to the temples, to the churches. That's where you get your religious infusion. But the most sublime sacrifice or articulation of this relationship with God is, things are right. I'm enjoying this world. I partake of it. My home is an expression of this. There is a unique Jewish character to this carbon, which is why, from a Jewish legal perspective, only a Jew was allowed to bring this sacrifice. Non-Jews were allowed to come to the temple and bring sacrifices, because from a religious standpoint, they could relate to the idea of God, of one of dependence, or of one of thanks. But this uniquely Jewish characteristic that is built up from within the Jewish tradition, was uniquely Jewish. And that is what Yaakov brought. I didn't need anything. I'm not dependent, but I'm just right. I'm good. And within that context, religion is found. Spirituality is found. Not only in the feeling of dependence or not only in the feeling of thanks or striving, but I'm enjoying life. Things are right. And in within that context, a person finds an expression of his religious identity. So this unique characteristic of a carbon I find so empowering. 
because my religious identity isn't just one of dependence of God and all these other aspects that might be part of it. But the fact that at the core of the Jewish worldview is, ideally things should just be good, should be right. And within that feeling of being right, my religion has a strong position. Another principle to feed off this legal structure that Judaism offers us, you eat of this carbon. The one who brings it up eats of it. Think about how anathema that is. It's for God. What are you doing? But that's not the Jewish way. The Jewish way is no, I am enjoying this carbon because it's representing the fact that I'm in life and things are good. And that is still a context in which I find God. I find purpose. Not only when I'm in need or I'm scared, but when things are right. So we've given voice to this key principle of the Jewish tradition, an empowering idea. But I want to end off with giving it expression from the voice of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, once again a 12th century poet, philosopher, who wrote a classic, the Kuzari, at the very beginning of the book. In brief, the story goes, it's written in a dialogue, a conversation between a king and a rabbi, but the point being that at the very beginning there's this king, a non-Jewish king, who has a dream, and this dream is that an angel appears to him and tells him that his intentions are good, but his actions are lacking. And he goes on an investigation between Christianity, within Islam, within the philosopher or the scientist of the time. The question can be asked, why a king? What was being given symbolic expression with using a king as part of your story? Now, I know people will say, well, he was recording the story of the actual Khazar kingdom. Well, simply speaking, he wasn't. He was using that as a rhetorical platform for his philosophy. What does a king add from a symbolic standpoint? I want to propose that it's the same principle from Rav Hirsch and the idea of a shlomim. The shlomim, which once again gave articulation to this, I'm not in need, I'm not dependent, I'm just right. And I still feel that there is a place, that my life is infused with God or spirituality, but I'm not in need of anything, is given voice by the Kuzari's king. A king goes on this journey, a king investigates other world views. Why a king? Well, a king has everything. A king has wealth. A king has affluence. A king has family. A king has really whatever he wants from a materialistic standpoint. A king doesn't go searching for religion because he needs something. The classic accusation that the modern world has leveled at religion. No. A king goes on an investigation because within life being perfect, there is an aspect, there is a thirst, there is a desire for a transcendent goal, a transcendent meaning. And that isn't something from a materialistic standpoint that you need God for. No, you feel you have a duty. That calling that an individual has, that he's striving for meaning or purpose beyond himself. That is a moral principle. You are looking to give, you are looking to achieve, you are looking to add to the world. And that isn't a materialistic standpoint. That transcends the mere needs that we have in our lives. And that is given by the fact that it is a king doing this searching. So to draw the parallel, we have a king, a king by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, that gives voice to this idea that it isn't just stuff you need or dependence that people search out religion. Rav Hirsch, in the same way, tells us that the almost the pinnacle of Jewish sacrifices of articulating a relationship with God is when things are just right that uniquely Jewish characteristic, you enjoy it, it's part of your family table. But within that context, you give expression to your duty. You give expression to that relationship you have with God. So to recap, we spoke about the timeless nature of someone like Rabbi Yehuda Halevi and Rav Hirsch, how they transcended their environment. Historically, that mattered. They weren't brought up in a dogmatic society where there was only one truth. There were many options on the table, and this gave rise to their ability to describe Judaism and its meaning and its purposes from its own terms, from its own point of view, from within itself. As opposed to someone like Maimonides, valuable and essential as he may be, but his approach was very different. And then we ended with an idea that is profoundly Jewish and in a beautiful way an idea that becomes so empowering in this day and age, that Judaism's Ideal state isn't one of dependence, isn't one of need, isn't one of asking for. But when you have everything, 
given voice by the king of the Khuzari, or by Rav Hirsch with the Shlomim. Things are just right. And in that context, you recognize your duty. You recognize your moral purpose. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>